Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending. So we're going to talk about BPF again. Uh, so many of you probably know that we can somewhat um, trace many things on Linux with BPF. Uh, I want to talk about how to try and understand what may go wrong with those BPF programs themselves. So not trying to try something else, but just uh, the BPF programs. So I'm Quentin. I've been working with BPF for the last four years or so. Uh, first in a company called Sixwin doing software acceleration for, uh, for packet processing for networks. Then at Netronome, uh, where I worked on a hardware offload of uh, BPF packet processing. Uh, so with all of that, you may, you may find that some of the <coughs> examples are slightly more focused on uh, BPF for network processing rather than uh, tracing, but um, everything I will present should be uh, the same for the different use cases. So BPF is uh, the extended version of Berkeley Packet Filter. Um, you could use it to write uh, your own programs, for example, in C code, and then compile them into eBPF bytecode and inject that into the kernel uh, where it is verified in order to make sure that the programs are safe and that they terminate in order to avoid uh, security issues or uh, crashing your kernel, uh, these kind of small issues you would want to avoid. Um, so you, you have an interpreter in the kernel. Uh, you also have a JIT compiler to, to get better performance with BPF programs. And once they are loaded in the kernel, you can attach them to one of the existing uh, hooks. So for example, network processing or tracing hooks. Um, so, so yeah, that's about it. So the instructions are 64-bit. Uh, you have 11 registers, 500-byte uh, stack. Uh, it's not ring complete in the sense that we don't have generic loops. Now we have bounded loops. Um, and it comes also with a number of additional features. We have uh, maps that are shared between uh, BPF programs in the kernel and user space or several BPF programs. Uh, we have some functions we can call from the kernel. We have BTF, on which I'll come back later. Um, so that's about it for, for, for BPF. The, the following diagram can uh, summarize uh, workflow. So we uh, compile our C program into eBPF instructions that we inject into the kernel. Uh, it may or may not be JIT compiled, and at some point we'll attach it to a hook where it's run well when the event occurs, so where the function that we want to trace is triggered, for example. Um, so the, the, the rest of the presentation will be organized like this. Um, like this. That's better. So, uh, reminder of eBPF that's done. Uh, the tools to inspect BPF uh, objects, uh, so we have a number of them. I would like to, to introduce them uh, in the first part uh, for the different steps of that diagram I just showed before. Um, and then, in a second part, I'd like to make a somewhat deeper introduction to BPF tool, which is used a lot to try uh, to get some uh, information about uh, the objects, uh, the BPF objects loaded in the system, so that would be programs and maps, for example. Um, I would like also to give a brief overview of the possible next steps in terms of uh, BPF introspection and debugging, uh, what's being discussed at the moment in the community and what we could do. So I just forgot to mention the main use cases for BPF. So we have networking, tracing, uh, we have also some uh, use case for circuit filtering between C groups. Uh, there is a work in progress for Linux security module, and we have also more use cases, smaller ones uh, that, you, that exist today, and probably some others that will uh, appear in the future. So let's start with uh, the first step of our workflow. When I try to uh, compile a C program, for example, into eBPF bytecode, uh, at that step of the process, I want to make sure that the eBPF bytecode is uh, consistent with the program I had in mind, with what I wanted to, to create. And um, so how can I do that? Uh, so I have this Clang command line, because you compile your, your C into BPF with Clang and LLVM. There is also a, a GCC uh, backend now, but it's uh, not as complete as Clang. Um, and once I have my object file, uh, I can use LLVM objdump to dump the, the, the bytecode of the program. So that's what we have here. 
uh, B7, and the, the, the rest of zeros is putting the value zero into register zero, which is used uh, for, uh, for storing the return value of the program. <coughs> and then I have a second instruction which says exit and return from the program. So return zero, basically. Um, I can also get the, the C source code in that output if I were to, uh, to provide the uh, dash T flag to Clang and uh, use the different options with LLVM option. Uh, so that's useful to, to check what, what I have in my object file. Um, I have an option also uh, that might be useful, which is instead of uh, compiling directly from C into eBPF uh, bytecode, I can compile into assembly, eBPF assembly, and uh, that gives me an assembly file, a .s file, that is much easier to, to edit if I want to change my BPF uh, code itself without having to, uh, to write all the code by hand. And if I want to test a specific sequence of instructions to test some kernel BPF feature, to test, so for example, for hardware flows, we wanted to make sure that some uh, instruction sequences were processed uh, in a particular way, so that's useful. Uh, and Clang, again, can compile this assembly into uh, regular BPF. Um, so that's it for the first step. There's not much to debug really at this point. Uh, that's mostly to inspect things. Uh, that's also the case when you try to load your program. So you have your BPF bytecode and you're trying to um, mostly pass the verifier that's something here in the kernel acting as a guardian somehow and that often tells you, no, this I don't want of it. Uh, there is a security risk, so uh, you have to, to change your program. So um, we want to, the program to pass the verifier, or at least we want to understand why it's rejected, uh, which is uh, essential in uh, improving the program to get something that works. Uh, so we have a, a variety of resources that can be used to uh, inject the program uh, into the kernel and possibly get this uh, output information from the verifier, the, the debug information that the verifier sends back. So there is libbpf, which is uh, in particular used in BPF tool, which is a command line utility. Uh, for networking, we have IPTC, uh, BCC, but BCC is mostly used with uh, tracing use cases, tracing programs. So we can uh, load programs with those tools uh, without having to re-implement everything ourselves and use and call manually the BPF system call. Um, and we can do some additional management of the BPF programs and maps. Uh, so we have uh, different things that can give us some information. We have uh, the logs from the verifier. We have uh, kernel logs sometimes for some specific uh, BPF errors. Uh, for networking, we can have uh, netlink extract messages to from IP or TC, for example. And we have some places where we have documentation to understand those errors. So typically that would be the filter.txt uh, documentation file uh, in the kernel documentation or the CDM guide about BPF, uh, which is uh, really complete. Um, so this is a non-exhaustive list of what the verifier tries to, uh, to check. So if you have uh, not valid BPF syntax, it will be rejected. Too many instructions, uh, more than the kernel supports, it will be rejected, and so on and so forth. Uh, so just so that you can have a look at an example error message from the verifier. So I'm trying to inject a program here, and I'm trying to read a packet, uh, a network packet, but I haven't checked that the offset inside that packet um, is a safe offset in the term that uh, my packet is big enough for me to uh, try and access uh, the, the, the given offset in the packet. So I have a potential risk of uh, out-of-bound access, which may never happen because if I'm trying that on the second byte of the packet, I never have an out-of-bound access because my packet will always have a MAC header. So I, I, I virtually have no risk, but the verifier doesn't care. If logically there is a risk of out-of-bound access, the program is rejected. Um, so the message is very useful when you know what you're talking about, uh, BPF context, invalid BPF context access. But for newcomers especially, that's very cryptic messages. It's very hard to understand what it refers to. Um, so 
we, we, we would like to have some better things in the future, maybe some uh, additional documentation or FAQs uh, that would uh, tell us where to, to look in that case. Uh, but still, we do want to have those messages, so it's especially important to be able to, to print them into the console or you're just on your own to understand uh, what's going on. So uh, we have uh, some debug flags that can be passed to, uh, to the tools, to the various tools. So you have to provide, for example, if you, if you were to uh, inject all on your own, your program um, with uh, a custom uh, management program calling the BPF uh, system call, yourself, you would have to be careful to, uh, to pass a buffer to the kernel too, so that the kernel can write into this buffer uh, the, the logs that correspond to that message we, sh we, we, we saw just before. Um, because we have a number of tools already, such as BPF tool uh, and libpf, which is used in BPF tool, uh, such low-level buffer management is um, already done for us to some extent, but uh, for example, libpf itself does have an additional number of debug information too, so that might be uh, information about, hey, now I'm trying to inject a program in the kernel, or before that, hey, now I'm trying to perform elf relocation about some stuff from a given section of your object file that I'm trying to uh, put back to the correct place into the rest of the BPF instructions. We have a number of elf magic stuff that's happening <coughs> uh, before injecting the program. So um, you, you, you may have to, uh, to tell the BPF to dump this information. So for BPF tool, for example, you can have information from uh, libpf and from uh, the, the kernel with a dash dash debug uh, option. So that's something uh, useful to know too. Um, so for interpreting this information, we have uh, that's the, the same uh, locations that I mentioned earlier, the filter.txt documentation, the Cilium guide. Uh, there is also some additional information now on the documentation slash uh, networking, I think, slash BPF. Um, although it's uh, still not perfect, I think. Uh, the, the hardcore solution, if you don't get anything better, is to uh, go and read the kernel code. Uh, yeah, that's not really ideal, too. Uh, so, yeah, maybe in the future we'll have something a bit uh, more user-friendly. That would be nice to, to, to have. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so now we have managed somehow to, uh, to fix our program and to pass the verifier based on the, on the output. We managed to make it work to add the check that was missing for uh, the packet access. So the program is now loaded in the kernel. It's not attached yet. Uh, it can be attached. Um, it's just here in the kernel. It's referenced by something in user space so that it doesn't get wiped out from the kernel. So that can be a file descriptor typically. Um, or when the program gets attached, then it's referenced in the kernel until we, uh, we, de we detach it. So uh, we have our program sitting here. And what can we do with it? With it? So we have an options, a number of options, uh, such as listing existing programs in the kernel and maps and dumping those pr the instructions for those programs or the content of those maps. So maps will typically be array maps or hash maps or there are a number of additional maps for some specific use cases. Um, so BPF tool here is uh, the, the, um, the main tool that we use uh, on a daily basis to, to, to inspect those objects when they are loaded in the kernel. Um, I'll come back to BPF tool later, though. I'll just move on to something else, which is uh, BTF for BPF. <coughs> Sorry, for BPF type format. Uh, so, since uh, kernel 4.18, I think, so that's recent, BTF objects can be used to embed some debug information uh, about the, the BPF programs and maps. Um, so, it's something that's similar to the dwarf format that's being used with GDB, for example. So, you have a number of information that are stored into your object file and that are passed down to the kernel when you eject your program which means that the kernel does have some, may have some information about the BPF programs or maps. Uh, so for programs, it's just a matter of using uh, a recent enough version of uh, Clang and LLVM and passing the debug flag. 
formats, we have to do some wrapping in the source code. So what I have here is a uh, uh, classic definition of my uh, BPF map that would be in the C source code. And I have above that to, um, to, to, to add some information in particular about the type for the key, which is a, a pointer to an int, and, a, and the type for the, for the value, which is a point to that struct. Uh, there are more details, uh, sadly, just mostly in the commit log of that change for now. Uh, the reference for uh, seeing how those things work would be the uh, samples and self-tests in the, in the kernel <coughs> repository for now. We're still waiting for documentation to, to, to catch up. Uh, so an example of a program that's being dumped with uh, a BTF format, uh, I have the, sorry, didn't want to click, I have the regular BPF uh, bytecode instructions here and below, and in the middle of that, I have the C instructions. I hope you can read, hopefully somewhat. So here I have uh, an int balancer ingress, which is the name of the function. Here I have um, if data plus uh, offset is uh, superior to data end, then and my program goes on. So this is the C instructions uh, that were used to compile the, the, the program into BPF bytecode. Uh, but I get this information from the kernel now because the kernel knows this information about the program. Um, so that's, uh, that's useful to, to, to understand what's going on. And it's also being used for some other BPF features in the sense that BTF objects uh, like this, uh, are checked by the kernel, especially for maths. They are checked for consistency so that you cannot just uh, load anything, any information uh, you like to, but something that really corresponds to the map that's being loaded. And some advanced uh, BPF features uh, rely on BTF uh, objects to, to work, but that's something uh, different. So uh, just Let's just think of it as, as giving information available to us for now. Um, so I have had the possibility to inspect my, uh, my objects in the kernel, and uh, that's good. I have my programs loaded now. I want to run them, maybe. So I want to do some actual work with my programs, some processing, some tracing, whatever. Uh, so I attach them uh, to one of the hooks in the kernel. So for tracing, that would be trace points or K probes. Uh, for, for networking, that would be TC hooks or uh, XDP at the driver level. And uh, for the other use cases, that's something different still. But how can I understand uh, why my program doesn't work as I expected? I mean, I've attached my program to an interface and it doesn't drop the packets I wanted it to drop or it doesn't give me the arguments of the function I was expected to, to trace. So what's happening? Uh, we have a number of solutions. We don't have uh, a step-by-step -step debugger yet, so it's mostly, again, about introspection. Um, we do have a printf-like thing, because we in kernel it's more printk-like thing. Uh, it's a function that, that can be called from the BPF programs themselves, so it's just when you're debugging a program with printfs everywhere, that's same thing, uh, except it doesn't print to the console because it runs in the kernel. So it goes to a CSFS file or pipe. You have two files actually that can be used. Um, and you, you, you get the output of uh, whatever information you feed to your program. Uh, so you have to use a constant string at the first argument, uh, but that's pretty much the same thing as uh, other printf functions otherwise. Uh, so in that case, I'm printing the four uh, first bytes of uh, packets. So uh, I pass the format string, the size of the format string, and then the data that I want to uh, use for um, person X here. So that's good for debugging, for understanding what's going on. That's not good in terms of performance. So we have a different mechanism, which is a bit more complex to use, uh, perf event arrays. But that can be used to stream data more efficiently from the kernel to user space. So that's what you would use, for example, if you were to uh, re-implement uh, TCP dump, but 
with BPF programs attached to uh, XDP interface, you would stream data with uh, pair fusion arrays, or uh, you could use that to send the flow of data like for tracing each time a system call is called uh, and you want to print the arguments for that system call, that's uh, also possible to, uh, to, to use perf event arrays to notify the user space and user space can print them into the console. So you could have uh, something that's close to a trace, at least uh, in, appear in appearance, uh, you would have something somewhat similar. So, uh, yeah, and one of the advantage of this is that it can be used with the hardware flow for network processing too. Um, <coughs> so, one thing that's interesting too is that BPF can be used for tracing, right? So, why don't we reuse BPF for tracing BPF programs? Well, actually, that's possible now. Uh, since the, the latest Linux version, I, I'm not even sure it's out 5.5. I think it's uh, being. Um, it's the merge window right now. Uh, so we do have a, a possibility <laughs> to attach BPF programs at the entry or the exit of another BPF programs, at least for networking programs. I'm not sure it works with tracing programs. So at least for networking programs. It's in 5.5, it doesn't. Okay, so it doesn't. But for networking programs, that it's supposed to work. So you can uh, you can have the uh, the input packet, the, the data of the packet you you are processing with the program you are debugging, and you can also get the the output data. Uh, so you can check the difference between the two and see how your program uh, managed to process the packet. Um, you can also use uh, BCC or BPF trace to inject programs to trace the kernel if you are hitting um, some, some unknown issue that's happening. For example, uh, during verification time, uh, I've been using BPF trace a couple of times to understand uh, what was the function uh, inside the kernel verifier that was rejecting my programs. Uh, so it can be useful to some extent, but that's uh, not the easiest way to, to understand what's going on. But still, that's something uh, good to, to think about if you're stuck otherwise. Um, so we have a, a feature that can help us uh, testing BPF programs. And by testing in test runs, I mean uh, instead of attaching a program to a network interface uh, and wait for packets, what I do is uh, manually tell the system to run this program, not on a real packet, but on that input buffer and to give me back the output data once the program has run. So there is a specific uh, program type for that. Uh, that can be, uh, no, that's not a program type, sorry. That's a, a subcomment for the BPF system call. Uh, and that works best, again, with networking program because it's a bit more tricky to, to use with tracing programs. Uh, so you, you provide input, you get output, and you can uh, see what's happening. Uh, it has some limitations, so uh, not all program types. Uh, for tracing, it's a bit difficult to check how kernel data structures that might be changed by the program are, uh, are changed or not. So it's a bit more complicated to implement. Uh, some BPF helpers are, uh, so those functions that you can call from within BPF programs uh, are very hard to support in that, uh, with that mechanism. Uh, for example, when you try to redirect a packet to a different interface, how can you check that it really worked just by getting an output buffer? That's um, another issue. And we would like, well, some people at least would like to have this feature available for uh, non-root users in order to run test suits on BPF programs. But there are security issues again, so, um, so yeah. So a number of these uh, limitations are, have been proposed uh, in a conference in March, NetDev conference, uh, for, for discussion. So things might evolve and uh, improve, hopefully. Um, another thing that might be useful for understanding what's going on is uh, that you have statistics now uh, regarding programs, so uh, you have to, active the, uh, to activate them with uh, syscontrol, and then you get uh, the duration of your program run and uh, the, the number of uh, times the program has run. So at least you can check that your program has run the number of times you expected it to run. Uh, 
uh, it's not enabled by default because there is a slight overhead for uh, gathering statistics when you run the program, so you have to, uh, to activate it. Uh, small number of machine learners, uh, things to, uh, to know about uh, debugging at runtime too. So perf has support for annotating GBPF programs. Uh, so you can run perf top and go to uh, the annotated part and you can uh, find the instructions of your program uh, on which the CPU is spending some time. Uh, so who knows if you need to, to check what's happening on that side, uh, you're being covered. Um, there are a number of uh, user space BPF machines, so they are nowhere as complete as what's in the kernel, but still if you wanted to uh, run a BPF machine under GDB, uh, today you would have to turn to, uh, to one of those user space machines. So UBPF especially is in C, or BPF is in Rust, uh, but otherwise they're pretty equivalent. Um, <coughs> There is a small debugger tool, I think it's step by step, I don't remember, it's a debugger tool, but it's for uh, legacy CBPF, uh, which is much simpler than eBPF, so also simpler to debug, uh, and that's under the kernel repository. Uh, so that's about it for uh, loading and running BPF programs. I just wanted to uh, speak quickly about uh, writing um, programs in user space to manage your uh, BPF objects. So, um, so what we want is the ability to, uh, to debug such programs to, uh, to improve BPF support in the tool chain in general. So we have uh, the ability to use Zeus frameworks that work already, BCC, BPF Trace, libcafe as a li uh, library I've been working for, and uh, that turns some filtering rules into BPF programs, uh, network filtering rules into BPF programs. Um, you have uh, libbpf, of course, that can be used to uh, implement your programs managing BPF objects. Uh, you have a feature that allows you to uh, dump the list of uh, BPF-related features uh, on your system uh, with BPF tools so that you can check what's available, what program types are available, what map types are available, uh, what BPF helpers even and uh, if the BPF syscall in the first place is supported, these kind of things. Um, since it's a debugging tool anyway, we have support for BPF in S-Trace. Uh, we have BPF support in Valgrin, although in Valgrin I think it might be getting a bit outdated. Uh, but S-Trace I think is mostly up to date. Uh, so that's really nice to, to have, um, especially when you're trying to to inject a program into the kernel and you don't get much information, you just get an error code. And it turns out that uh, your BPF2 program has been uh, trying several different things, like uh, checking that basically uh, I can inject a very simple program and then it tried to create a map and then at last it tried to inject your program. So which of those different codes failed, I'm not really sure, so I can trace it with a trace. Uh, that's uh, very useful. So that's it about the introspection, debugging BPF in general. I wanted to, uh, to talk a bit more about uh, BPF tool because that's really a useful tool to, to do all those things. Uh, not all of them, but most of them. So um, one of the, I hope you can read at the, at the back of the room, one of the simplest function is listing the programs that are running on the system. So I have BPF tool prog show. So this is a list of um, programs attached to, um, to circuit and in C groups. So the, the, those first seven programs uh, had actually been loaded by system D on my system for fire rolling things. Um, and then at the end, there is one program that I had uh, added to, but XDP, so networking processing. Um, I can list those programs. I can also dump the instructions. So I can dump the, what we call the translating instructions that's after my program has been loaded into the kernel. Uh, kernel verifies the program and does a number of rewrites. And uh, because of that, there are some small changes, possibly not in terms of, um, of the, the logics of the program, but just in terms of uh, small offsets regarding to the, the different data structures being used. Uh, so I can have just these 
uh, instructions as they are in the program, but I can also uh, dump the JIT instructions. So in the second case, it was JIT compiled into um, a native binary for, for uh, x86, and I can get all those instructions. Um, so that's, that's interesting to, to, to see what's happening with the JIT compiler. Uh, I can load the program. I can attach it to a variety of hooks. Uh, I don't think I can attach it to K probes or trace points uh, with BPF2 at this time. Um, so I have the rated commands, BPF2 prog load, BPF2 prog attach, uh, C group attach, and for networking that would be net attach. Um, yeah. Uh, I can work with maps too, so I have BPF2 uh, map show to list the maps all those uh, LPM try uh, were, were related to the um, system D programs injected in my system. Uh, I can look up entries in maps. So here's a case of a very simple array map and I'm dumping the content of um, the first entry. So what we don't have here is uh, BTF, which is missing. With PTF information, uh, I would have more data than this. I forgot to, to put the picture. Uh, I would have uh, the, the fields uh, of uh, my entry. So my entry here is a, comes from a C struct with a number of fields of attributes. And I would have the name of the attributes and the values beside them instead of just a blob of hexadecimal values. Uh, so I can dump the full map at once too. Um, I can update an entry in the map or delete an entry in the map too. Uh, it even works for some specific, uh, more specific map types such as the one used for jumping from one program into another one. You have these kind of features and uh, BPF tool is uh, really helpful to, to just update the map. I'm sorry, this picture is really small. I'm not sure why. Uh, so the idea is uh, what I presented earlier. Can I zoom on that? I don't know how to zoom on that, I'm sorry. Uh, so it shows a list of BPF features spotted on the system. So first one is BPF syscall uh, for unprivileged users is enabled on that system. JIT compiler is disabled and so on and so forth. You have, we have a number <coughs> of uh, BPF related config options uh, for, uh, that were used when compiling the kernel uh, so that we know uh, what BPF features will be available. And all that can be reused when you, uh, when you write user space programs uh, working with BPF stuff. Um, yeah. So this is uh, not too big, but not as small a uh, picture of uh, BPF prog runs. So what I'm doing here is uh, just running a, a test run of a program I've loaded previously into the kernel. So I'm providing, so I have BPF tool prog run uh, this is a handle to my program. Um, I'm providing input data, data in, and uh, my input file, data out, and dash to, tell it to, to, to dump into the console. And I want to run that program 10 times, so I get here the output data. Uh, hello, Twitter, that was because <laughs> I wanted to put that in a, in a, in a tweet. Uh, return value of the program is zero, and I have the duration on average of those 10 runs. Um, so here it is for, for, for uh, test runs. So some additional features for BPF tool uh, without any uh, screenshots because they're too small anyway. Uh, so we can uh, list programs per C group, per network interface to uh, per tracing hook. So we can really inspect at that tracing hook, what do I have? Uh, we can load several programs at once. Uh, especially useful when you have a number of programs with uh, what we call tail calls and you jump from one into the other one. Um, we can dump directly uh, into the console the output of BPF trace print K. We can dump from um, perf event maps. Uh, there's a thing about a uh, generation of a skeleton header file uh, for, um, for, for, for helping with writing programs for managing BPF objects, but that's pretty new. We have batch mode, we have JSON support, uh, which is pretty nice, uh, batch completion and more. So I had made a, a Twitter thread if you want to look into that. 
Uh, more information, obviously, there is some documentation for BPF tool at least. Uh, we have man BPF tool and uh, different uh, man pages for the different subcommands, so BPF tool uh, prog, BPF tool map, and so on. Um, so here you are ready to use BPF tool now. Uh, it's it's being packaged now on Fedora and Ubuntu too on the latest ones. Uh, I think it should be added to 1804 some some sometime. Uh, otherwise, BPF tool is uh, is located under the kernel repository. Uh, a few words about what's coming next for BPF uh, debugging. So we want to um, add more stuff to debug, like can we have more modular programs with more modular curves between programs. Uh, so there is something that was added really recently to the kernel uh, for having that. Could, could that help with, for debug, maybe? Uh, there is a discussion about adding more information to the CSFS uh, system file, uh, and also a discussion about improvements for the test run feature. Um, it would be really, really also nice to have a real step-by-step -step debugger for BPF. Uh, we don't have that at the moment, but people are really thinking into, into that, so how can we do that? Should we? Sorry? Why Petrace? Why Petrace? Why Petrace? I, I, I don't know Petrace enough to, to know if that would work. That's, a, that's an idea, maybe. So we have a yeah. We should we should talk about that. <laughs> so here are some uh, some ideas that were proposed uh, besides Ptrace. Uh Running a program in a VM, freezing and freezing it is that doable? Extend the BPF prog test run interface. Uh, attach K probes to uh, every single instruction. Is that something doable? Uh, that just leads to explore for now. Uh, we, we would like, I would like at least have an updated documentation uh, because what's existing is not always up to date and I th definitely think we would uh, benefit it from a real troubleshooting guide that would tell you uh, this error is often related to uh, that thing in your source code that you should, should change to uh, that other thing. Uh, so again, uh, in particular, the things about step-by-step uh, -step debugging and uh, CSFS uh, are being proposed to the next NetDev conference in March. Uh, so to conclude, uh, debugging BPF programs is not trivial. We don't have a step-by-step -step debugger yet, but the tooling is getting better and better. We have more tool, more efficient. Uh, we can dump instructions and map contents at any stage uh, of the workflow. We can print data when the program is running. We can do test runs in the kernel. We can run uh, um, in user space, uh, BPF VMs. That's not the best we can do, but uh, that can help debugging what's happening. Uh, BPF itself can be used to, um, to, to, to inspect other programs, uh, which is really nice. We have the, should have added here, the BTF uh, debug info format that's being used to provide more information. So, all of this is, it's here, it's already very good, and hopefully we will have better things in the future too. Uh, so, fingers crossed. <coughs> and that's it for my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> so, I don't know if you have time for questions. Yes. Quick. Okay, so, yeah. You, you, you can, if you want to generate it yourself. So, so the question is. So, so if you want to code your own BPF uh, assembler program, uh, you can do that. Uh, you might hit a number of uh, issues, not on basic program. It will work for basic programs, not using uh, advanced features. But if you're trying to use uh, BTF debug information, for example, or uh, more advanced uh, calls from one program to the other one. There is a number of things that are happening uh, when I mentioned health relocation stuff. And this is getting more and more complex, so you could re-implement that, uh, but that 
would not be trivial. So libbpf is really a reference here. Uh, it doesn't prevent you to work on your side with another BPF assembler, but uh, for more complex stuff, you will have uh, more work to do and more time to spend on that. Uh, other questions? Yes. It's possible to handle an hardware interrupt from a BPF uh, so, Sorry, can you speak loud? It's possible to handle an hardware interrupt from a BPF uh, is it possible to to manage a hardware interrupt from BPF program? I don't think so. I'm not sure. I don't think so. You don't have a hook on that, I think. So I would say no. Uh, there was another question at the back. Yeah. I'm sorry. Can you can you speak louder or come over here, please? Push it away. It's time is up. Yes. <coughs> Last, question. Last question. Yeah. Uh, how big uh, on average available to be a program, program camera? So is it uh, the same as the <laughs> Yeah. So so how big is a uh, is a network programming uh, BPA uh, is a network BPA program on average? Uh, it was limited to 4K instructions before, and now it's limited to up to 1 million instructions, but that's not really true because that's the number of instructions that the verifier um, can check, and it checks some instructions several times. And so the average, it's hard to, to tell because it depends on what you're running, uh, but the 4K limitations was definitely a, li uh, a hard limit to some people, and they wanted to have more than that. Uh, that's also why you can jump from one program to another one, uh, one, one motivation was to circumvent that limitation. Uh, so I don't have a number in mind, but uh, programs can range to a few, few dozen instructions to thousands and thousands of instructions now. So it, it really depends on the complexity of your programs. You're welcome. <laughs>